Uh, this morning, we have the great privilege of having two of our missionaries, uh, John and Ann Powers, uh, visiting with us. Uh, John's going to be bringing us the message, and Ann's going to read some scripture for us. Uh, but uh, we have been supporting them for many years. Uh, they were uh, stationed in Eastern Europe, particularly in Budapest. Uh, they are now back in the United States, and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing John bring the word, but also share uh, some of what they are currently doing. Good morning. I um, moved kind of slow with the white cane, so uh, but I made it up here. It's a joy for Ann and me to be here with you again. We, uh, we so appreciate the part you've had in making it possible for us to serve God for many years in Romania and then in Hungary. And now these past couple years, we've been serving here in the U.S. down in Orlando. If you and I were to sit down and get to know each other, we might start by talking a little bit about what we do, and sooner or later, we might start talking about our families if we really wanted to get to know each other. I might tell you a few things about myself. Uh, for example, when my, um, when my parents got married, my mother was told she might not have any children. My mother had 11 children. <laughs> um, my mother says that um, later on, after one of her deliveries, that doctor that told her she might not have any kids actually came into the room and said, Mrs. Powers, every time I read you've had another child, it makes me want to take my diploma back to medical school. <laughs> um, that doctor was wrong, and I'm glad <laughs> for that. But if, if, if I were to tell you about myself, there's probably some things I would not tell you. There's some things I actually wouldn't want you to know because they're kind of embarrassing. Have you ever noticed what God does when he tells the story about his family? When we read the Bible, we learn about God's people, his family. We learn about the work he's been doing through all of history to draw a people to himself and through them, the whole world and God, the whole world learns about God and God is glorified. But as God tells the story about his people, he shows their, their heroic actions, their incredible faith, and their sacrificial love. But he does more than that. He tells things about his people, about his family, that are, they're surprising. Some of them, some of the things he shows are, they're embarrassing. And some of the things that we see, they're actually shocking. I'd like for us to take a few moments to look at a couple examples where we see this combination of things. And it's looking at the life of Joseph in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. Joseph was the son of Jacob, one of the patriarchs of our faith. Jacob had 12 sons, and he had a favorite. That favorite was Joseph. And because of jo Jacob's favoritism, we see that there was envy in their family, and that envy led to hatred. And it got so bad that these brothers decided that they were going to kill Joseph. And as you probably recall at the last moment, Rather than killing Joseph, they sold him as a slave for silver. So here's Joseph being dragged off by these people that have bought him into a distant land. Certainly, Joseph knew about the calling of his family. God had said that through Jacob and his family, all of the nations would be blessed. They had a special role in God's plan. And now 
he's going off as a prisoner into a distant land because of his brothers. What do you think was going through Jacob's mind, through Joseph's mind, as he was going into Egypt? It was probably hard for him to fathom how, what was happening and what kind of injustice he had just suffered at the hand of his brothers. And these are supposedly God's people. I'd like for us to, so that's a little bit of a backdrop. And we come to Genesis chapter 39 as Joseph arrives in Egypt. Um, and I've asked Anne to read the, the first couple verses in Genesis 39. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Now Joseph, had been, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Am I on? Okay. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. You want me to do three? When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Did you notice that phrase that repeated itself just in these couple verses? The writer says, the Lord was with him. Now Joseph has suffered tremendously. He's been wronged. And in the world's eyes, it might appear that, that this person has been forsaken by God. He's been forgotten. But the word of God tells us something different. The word of God said that God was with him in the midst of those circumstances. And God was doing something very special. We see something similar in the life of David. David, in Psalm 23, says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And a few verses later, he says, Even though I go through the darkest valley, I will not fear, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We see the same idea with David. He's going through deep, dark valleys. And yet he talked about God's presence being with him. He talked about experiencing God in a very special way. James tells us in his epistle, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. In the trials of life, you and I can make choices. We can make choices to draw near to God and to experience him in very real ways. Some of you may be aware that several years ago, our younger son died unexpectedly in our home. He was 15 years old. And as you can imagine, there was a lot of grief and sorrow that followed in the weeks and months after that. About a day or two after Stephen died, we had several friends in our home. And that night, before everyone left, we decided to take a few moments and to reflect on how we saw God that day, what we saw God doing. And it was amazing. People just went on and on talking about different things. And then we prayed. That was a really special time. Some weeks later, one of my friends who was there that night, he said, John, it seems that that, that night, when we took that time to look and see what God was doing, he said, it seemed like something shifted in your home. He said, amidst the sorrow and the great sadness that we all felt, he said, 
it seemed like all of a sudden we became very, very conscious of God's presence with us. We became much more aware of what was doing amidst our deep sorrow. When my friend Jim said that to me, I thought, that is so true. And a number of our friends have said similar things. A former pastor of ours used to say this when he talked about going through trials and suffering. He said, we can respond in one of two ways. We can respond like this, raising a clenched fist towards God. Or he said, we can respond like this, raising an outstretched hand, seeking out and searching for God in the midst of the challenges that we face. I think it's very interesting that Joseph's brothers, they are living in the promised land. And if you read the chapters in Genesis that precede the story of Joseph and are around this story, you will see that his brothers, even though they're living in the promised land, they are floundering. And here is Joseph in a foreign land, suffering much. And yet spiritually, Joseph is flourishing. Something that we learn from the life of Joseph is that going through trials and suffering, rather than being a time when we're abandoned by God, that can be a very special time of drawing near to God and experiencing him in very unique ways. I'd like for us to look at one other example in the life of Joseph, and that is when Joseph re reveals his identity to his brothers. You'll recall that after these verses that were just read a little bit ago, when Joseph arrived in Egypt, um, through a series of amazing events, Joseph becomes the second in command in the country of Egypt. And after that happens, there is a great famine that comes sweeping across the land. And that famine also swept across the promised land where his brothers were living. And his brothers coming and seeking food in Egypt because they had stored food there. Lo and behold, they come across their brother Joseph and they don't even recognize him. And through a series of events where Joseph tests and tries his brothers, he eventually discloses his identity to them. So we're going to read a few verses now again from chapter 45. We're going to look at the first eight verses. Um, so, Anne, you want to go ahead and read those? And Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still a living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me Pharaoh, father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. 
is a very dramatic moment in the Bible. Here's this man, a ruler of a country, and he is weeping, and they can hear him through the whole palace. And here are his brothers, his 11 brothers. They are scared to death. And to their amazement, they realize that this ruler over this entire land is their brother who they had sold. And when Joseph reveals himself to them, they can't even speak. They're speechless. And in the course of talking with them, with them, he reminds them, I am here because you sold me. But he doesn't stop there. He also says, I am here because God sent me ahead of you. And he says that over and over. We see that phrase repeating itself three times in these verses. What does that tell you about Joseph? Think about what's behind that statement, that you sent me and God sent me. Here's a man who was beaten and mistreated by his brothers, sold into slavery, sent to a different land. He grew up away from all that was familiar to him, to his faith. He was away from his family. And now in this situation, Joseph could have crushed them if he wanted to. Yet we see that Joseph was able to step back and to look at things and not just to focus on his own experience. We see that Joseph was able to stand back and think about what is God doing through all this? What is God's purpose in these events? What is God's story? And we see that Joseph not, not only was able to see this, but he accepted it. He accepted the fact that God had sent him there. Joseph saw that God was in it. Joseph accepted that. And he submitted his life to God's story. Joseph understood that his life was part of a bigger plan. He understood that God is the sovereign author of all of history. And Joseph also realized that God was the author of Joseph's story. And Joseph trusted God, and he submitted his life to his heavenly father. That was no small thing for Joseph to do. What about you and me? Do you ever struggle to accept the things that God has allowed to be a part of your life? I think Joseph did. When Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, that was preceded by him just sobbing. That came at a great cost to him. It was not an easy thing. It's normal. It's human for us to struggle as we deal with the wreckage and the heartache that comes with living in this broken and cursed world. We see this over and over and over in scripture. We see this in the Psalms. But think about it. Here's this young man, Joseph. He was despised and forsaken by his own people. He was sold for silver. He was falsely accused and unjustly condemned. And eventually, he was raised 
to a position of power and became the savior of the whole world. Does that sound familiar? Isn't it beautiful to see how this person's choices to trust God and walk with him made him a person whose life pointed to Jesus? And we see that in the way Joseph's life parallels Jesus' life. And the good news is that that same thing is true for us. As you and I make decisions to trust our Father in Heaven with the, with the things that He allows to be a part of our lives, our lives can point people to Jesus. Through that, we can glorify God. Several years ago, I found out, I found out that I have an eye disease that leads to blindness. And to be honest, that's been a real struggle for me, and it still is. I used to tell people that if I was writing the story about John Powers, I would leave the blind chapter out. But I've decided I don't want to say that anymore. And I don't want to say that anymore because I just know too much about God. I know he's powerful, and I know he's wise, and I know he's good. And I don't want to say that I can write a better story with, with my life than God can. I want to be a person like Joseph, who trusted his heavenly father with the circumstances of his life. You see, Joseph's life, like my life, and your life, each of them are part of a bigger story, a grander story. And when we read the great stories of our day in literature, often those stories have dark chapters. And then we marvel to see how the author weaves those dark chapters into a greater story. And that is what God is doing with our lives. So you see, each of us, the decisions that we make, just as it was true in Joseph's life, the decisions that Joseph made had incredible consequences. And they pointed people to the greatness of God. And that same thing is true for you and me. As we face challenges and trials, we can make choices to draw near to God, to experience Him. And as we trust Him, we can trust that He will use our lives to point people to His greatness. And that's why we're here in this world. May God give us grace to be the kind of people that trust him in that way.